Hi everyone, and welcome to this quick tutorial where we're going to talk about the fundamentals of input actions in God of War and C Sharp. And just before we jump in the tutorial, I want to give a big shout out to Kerlang and Steven Rooks, who actually suggested this topic. So if you too have some Nitcoder concept that you'd like me to do a tutorial on, please go ahead and suggest one by dropping a comment down below. Ok, now by the end of this video, you'll know why input actions are an interesting tool, how to create custom ones in a Godot project, and how to use them in your Godot c -sharp code to trigger some specific actions on screen. Note that in this tutorial, I'll be reusing the scene and overall player setup that we discussed in this previous episode of the series, where we had a little 2D avatar that could move horizontally or jump. So those will be the two movements that will refactor to work with input actions, and of course, don't hesitate to check out this tutorial first if you haven't seen it yet. And of course, don't forget that if you want to get the files of either this previous tutorial or the current one directly, you can have a look at the GitHub repo with all my Godot tutorials over here. Also, as usual, since we'll be coding all logic in c -sharp, make sure that you have a version of Godot with .NET enabled. But now, with all that said, let's dive in and discover the basics of using input actions in Godot and C-sharp. Ok, before talking about the how, let's first quickly discuss the why. So in short, input actions are a layer of abstraction between the actual keys and buttons on your input device and the in-game actions. So instead of saying that we want our avatar to jump when we press the spacebar, for example, we'll say that we want it to jump when the jump action is triggered, and then we'll connect this jump action to the press of the spacebar. Now, I know that for now, it might look like we're doing just the same thing, except we've added an additional step in the middle. But that's where input actions really shine. Because now that we have this bridge, this mapping between the actual input device and the final game action, we can super easily change the input key, or even associate several ones to support cross-platform schemes, without having to change anything in our code, because the action in the middle still has the same name. Plus, the code itself will also be a bit more readable, since usually the name of the action is quite self-explanatory. And yes, by using this tool, we could even expose our bindings in some settings panel inside the game, so that players could directly set their own controls and adapt the inputs to their liking. So input actions make games more flexible and more user-friendly, because players can adapt the controls to fit their preferences and the hardware that they are using. It's an essential concept in modern game dev that enhances gameplay and accessibility. And the best thing is that, actually, all this flexibility is really simple to implement for us, game creators. When you want to define new custom actions for a Godot game, you need to hop in the Project Settings panel, because this is quite logically a project-wide setting. Once in the Project Settings window, we can switch to the Input Map tab, and there you get the editor where you can list, add and remove input actions for your project. And actually, if we toggle on this option to show the built-in actions, we see a list of some pre-made input actions that Kodo automatically adds in any new Kodo project. Of course, these are just some basic actions that Kodo assumes you might need in many games, and you see that they're mostly focused on navigating in an interface. For example, entering some menu, selecting another item, going through a page, and a lot more. So right now, we can already see that a really cool thing with input actions is that they can group a lot of different types of keys, buttons, or even input combos under a single item. Typically, here we have some actions that are triggered by a keyboard input, others by the move of a joystick, and others by some combination of inputs. But still, those actions are a bit too specific for us, and they're not very related to our code, so let's rather see how to create our own custom actions. First, we'll toggle the built-ins back off to get a clean list. Then, we'll go to the Add New Action Input field, 
and enter the name of our first action. For example, here we want our avatar to be able to move left. So let's just make a new action called move left, pretty straightforward. And once we click on the add button or we press enter on our keyboard, you see that our new action gets added to the list. Then if we wanted to rename this action, we could also re-click on it in the list and then change the name, or we could even remove it by clicking on the little bin icon on the right. Okay, now to actually add a binding to this action, meaning associate a real hardware input to this action mapping, we just need to click on the plus icon on the right of this line and select an input in this pop-up. Now, although we can of course navigate through the various types of devices and look for specific keys or buttons, Godot also has a pretty neat feature that is common to a lot of input action systems, which is the listening for a key feature. So basically we can just press on an input and Godot will auto-select it in the list. For example, by pressing a key on my keyboard, I'm directly selecting this input as the binding to add to my action. By the way, you'll notice that for key inputs, there are actually three possible modes, depending on whether you want to use the exact position on the keyboard or the character in case sensitive or case insensitive mode that is mapped on it. So this can be really cool to avoid the famous QWERTY versus AZT issue of American and French keyboards. But anyway, once you've selected the input that you want to associate to the binding, you simply need to click on the OK button and you see that the input gets added to the list of keys and buttons that trigger this specific action. For example, here I'm saying that pressing the left arrow key on a keyboard will trigger the move left action. Of course, what's cool is that, as we said before, we can associate multiple bindings to one action, so we could redo the same operation to also have the Q or A key move the character to the left, or even have the left joystick of a gamepad trigger the same action if we push it to the left. And so then, we simply need to do something equivalent for a move right action and for a jump action. And here we are! At this point, we have all the actions we need to refactor our player movement script and have our character move like it did before, but using input actions. To finish this tutorial, let's see how to use Godot input actions in c -sharp code. Now, as we said before, we are going to start from the code that we coded in this previous episode for our player's movement. And as you can see, for now, our process function that takes care of this move logic contains some if conditions where we check for specific keys on the keyboard. So currently, our script is a bit too basic, and it wouldn't work if we were using a gamepad controller, for example. Our goal here is to replace those direct key checks with action checks. And to do this, we simply need to replace our all checks with input.isActionPressed and pass in the name of the action to check to the function. However, for the horizontal movement, we could actually take advantage of another Godot utility for input actions, which is input.getAccess. Basically, by giving it the two actions associated with the two sides of a single direction axis, such as our horizontal movement here, you can directly get a float between minus one and plus one. So we could use it in our case by giving it the move left and move right actions to find out the current value of the horizontal axis input. Then we'll just multiply it by our move speed value, and we've just gotten back our actual horizontal movement, if any. Cause basically, this value will be minus one if we're pressing the left input, plus one if we're pressing the right input, and zero if we're not pressing anything. And what's really cool is that if we're using an analog input, like a joystick, the value will actually be between minus one and plus one, so our movement will be proportional to how much the joystick is moved from the center, which is pretty cool. So our code is now shorter, easier to read, and slightly more powerful. Of course, there's a lot more to do with input actions in Godot like creating or removing actions at runtime using the input map API, or getting more info from controllers and joysticks. 
But I'll let you have a look at the official docs to learn more about this, cause it really depends on your specific use case. And anyway, for little to this scene, that's basically it. If we restart our game with all the rest perfectly identical, we see that our avatar still moves horizontally and jumps, so we've properly reproduced our previous behavior, except that we're relying on input actions, and this could be cross-platform now. So we could actually connect a gamepad to move our avatar, or change our input bindings in the project settings, or even in an in-game settings panel, and we wouldn't have to change anything in our code. Though there's still a little thing that we could fix, and that's how our jumping currently works. Cause for now, if you keep the jump input action pressed, for example here I'm not releasing the spacebar, you see that the player character jumps endlessly, so as soon as it gets back on the ground, it starts jumping again. Meaning that you can't really control the jumps of the avatar. Usually, in most games, you rather trigger a jump just on the first input, and then you ignore all the following ones. To fix this, we just have to come back to our C-sharp script, and where we're checking for the jump action, replace our call to input.isActionPressed with input.isAction just pressed. This way, Godot will only trigger this bit of logic if the jump input action was triggered during this frame. And so this fixes our issue. Now if we run the game again, we see that when we press the jump action key for the first time, our avatar indeed jumps, but then it ignores our pressing of the key until we release and repress it completely again. So here you go. You now know how to set up custom input actions in a Godot project, and how to use them in a C -sharp script to react to those triggers and run specific in-game actions, be it with a keyboard, a mouse, a gamepad controller, or any other type of input device that you can set in the input action panel. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to leave a comment with ideas of good tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.